from streaming for like a week and a half there as I was struggling with some nighttime migraines. Uh, work's been really busy and I have a foster gecko, um, which I'll talk about on Instagram a little bit later. So I've got some, a few things I wanted to go over tonight. So basically, let me just close a couple of these things because they don't need to be open. Um, a friend of mine sent me a, an article, not this one, um, but another one that we're going to go over on airway management in rabbits. So um, effectively looking at some different studies talking about how we manage airways in rabbits. So um, I wanted to pull up a couple of different papers that I think are really important and really useful, um, useful resources, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, just kind of review them. So the first one is from the Journal of Exotic Pet Medicine from 2017. <clears throat> and this paper, this full paper is actually available for free online through Docs in Event. Um, so Docs in Event, are the people who make the V-Gel, which um, is a superglottic device that um, is kind of cool for rabbits. Um, it's available as well for dogs and cats, and I feel like they've announced that they're kind of working on a guinea pig model. Um, so their website has a lot of great resources on it, including this paper by Molly Varga. Uh, Molly Varga is a UK vet um, who was the editor of the, uh, the second edition of the textbook of rabbit medicine. So she is definitely somebody who knows what she's doing and talking about, clearly. And um, this whole paper is just a really useful summary on airway management. So... Um, it goes over, I guess, some of our, our of our airway challenges in rabbits. So in many of our companion species, like dogs and cats, we generally can easily visualize the glottis, so our airway opening, the tracheal opening, so that we can achieve airway control. Um, this is something that, you know, like we learn um, pretty early on in technician school or in vet school for the vets, um, reviewing that kind of thing I don't think is really necessary for tonight. Um, for those species, but in rabbits, we, of course, you know, many of you working with exotics know that airway management can be a challenge because they have a very long, narrow oral cavity. There's just a lot of tissue in there. They have indentations in their cheeks um, or indented cheek tissue that kind of makes their mouth really, <laughs> really tight. Um, and of course, the torus lingui uh, is this big fleshy, um, like protrusion at the base of their tongue. So um, it, it's kind of in the way of visualization. Um, in all but the largest rabbits, using a laryngoscope is very challenging. Um, I feel like in most tiny rabbits, unless you're using like a very small laryngoscope blade. Um, so uh, like I think it's a size zero Miller type blade, which is a straight blade. Um, you generally can't use a laryngoscope because there's just no space in small rabbits. So there's just so many different challenges to airway management in rabbits. And of course, they're, they're obligate nasal breathers. So the glottis is usually um, actually kind of engaged with a soft palate. So in the top of the mouth, which um, I actually have a diagram of this, which I should pull up from um, an ER talk I gave. Hang on because I should have prepared this beforehand. Hang on. Uh, mammal emergency. So let me just pull this up real quick. So this is just a talk that I gave at the OAVT 2022 conference. I gave a series of exotic emergency talks. And the image that I'm looking for to explain this is this one and then the next one. Um, so basically, um, because these, I, I think that this is really an adaptation to these animals always needing to eat. So rabbits, of course, are tiny little um, food goes in, poop goes out factories. They are constantly eating because they have a very low calorie diet that's high in fiber. So it's a very bulky, uh, like roughage based diet. So they have to constantly be eating to meet their energy needs because they're mammals and they're um, very active animals. So they definitely have to meet calorie needs that make sense for mammals, not like our reptiles and amphibians who have really low calorie needs typically. Um, so, so there's this theory that, um, that they, they're obligate nasal breathers because it kind of allows them to have those olfactory cues constantly while they're eating. So picture like if you're chewing and swallowing, you're having a really hard time like sniffing you're sniffing for predators, you know, if we sniff for predators while we were eating. So um, there's this idea that, you know, these uh, these 
hind gut fermenting herbivores have adapted this kind of mode of of um, both managing their airway while being able to eat constantly um, and also kind of present in some ungulates that are herb uh, herbivore ungulates as well <clears throat> so um, basically our nasal passage is our prime primary passage for our air flow into the uh, lower respiratory tract so your trachea your bronchi your lungs um, the soft palate here here i'm just going to turn this into slideshow for a sec so I can use the pointer because it looks a little bit nicer. So the soft palate basically is kind of like tickling the glottis. <laughs> it's kind of covering and engaged with the glottis when their head is in a natural position. So like when their head is doing like the normal bunny thing, like I guess it's got bunny ears. Um, but when their head's in a normal position, um, we see that the, uh, the soft palate, so the roof of the mouth that's extending past the hard palate into the soft palate, which like if you're intubating a brachycephalic dog, you're pushing that bad boy out of the way so you can see the glottis. Um, it's basically doing the same thing. So except it's it, it's very, very strongly engaged here with the epiglottis. So it's kind of covering it. And then let's go down one. When we hyperextend the neck, um, so we bring the neck up. So here's my rabbit head. Bring the neck up like this, um, the little rabbit. Uh, we actually kind of disengage the uh the soft palate with the epiglottis so that we can actually visualize the um visualize the, the glottis the tracheal opening so in <clears throat> so in rabbits um this is the position that we prefer so not like this but like this <laughs> uh, this is the position that we prefer for intubation whether you're doing a blind technique because otherwise when you have them in this position if you're just trying to pass your tube through your narrow uh oral opening the rabbit's just going to swallow the tube like there's no two ways about it. Like unless you have a really large rabbit who happens to have a really lax, uh, lax uh, arytenoids and like lax laryngeal folds or has like an abbreviated soft palate for some reason, um, <clears throat> you just can't intubate them in this position. So um, this is, you know, like this is a rookie mistake that we sometimes see tech servets make where they try to intubate a rabbit. They're not familiar with the anatomy. They try to do it in this position because this is technically, this is the position that we do it in other species really um in do i mean dogs and cats can be intubated like in lateral or dorsal recumbency or you know any other position really if you're um if you're able to if you're familiar with those techniques um so trying to intubate rabbits in this position doesn't work because of this anatomy and then we need to hyperextend the neck either to do a blind technique or to visualize using a laryngoscope in a larger rabbit which again this i find that's not usually very successful unless you have a very large rabbit um or you're using an endoscope to like directly visualize through the mouth and then this oropharyngeal area so here i'll jump back here so Oh, very, very challenging animals to intubate generally, unless you have some specialized equipment. And then even then there is a learning curve for endoscopes. So whether you have uh, a flexible endoscope where you do like the over the endoscope, you place your tube on the endoscope and then we introduce it into the glottis and then slide your tube in. Um, <clears throat> or uh, a rigid endoscope and you're doing the side by side technique. Those, those, you know, they allow for direct visualization. Once you get used to it, technically it's easier. It's still requiring some expensive equipment and of course, um, requiring that you practice the technique, preferably on cadavers before live patients. So the blind method is what I learned in school, um, which is like 20 years ago now. So the blind method is tried and true, but it's technically a little challenging and you can cause quite a bit of trauma to the glottis. So this is where we position the head in that like hyperextended, hyperextended, this is my rabbit ears, um, <clears throat> position. And then um, ideally with like a clear silicone uh, endotracheal tube so that we can visualize fogging or with the uh, listening technique, which I believe, yeah, they're, they're doing that here. This is a technique that I tend, I, I've historically had quite a bit of success with. Um, of course, you're measuring the tube before insertion like you would in any animal. Um, so you're basically kind of advancing the tube until you hear a breath sounds or until you see fogging in the tube. So it's indicating that you're over the glottis. And then um, we do apply a local anesthetic to the glottis or to the arytenoids so that um, we don't have laryngospasm because they are very spazzy little, it's a very spazzy uh, little set of cartilages. Um, just like in cats where we have to apply a local anesthetic prior to intubation. Uh, because if we're, um, if we are, uh, trying to kind of just like brute force force that tube in 
um, because it's very well vascularized, we can cause a lot of traumatic damage to the uh, to the arytenoids. So that often results in post anesthetic um, problems during recovery. So um, you know, presuming that you do get the tube in eventually. So um, if you're passing the tube in and you're having like several unsuccessful attempts where your your timing is not right or you're bouncing off or your tube is too big and often we have to go to a quite a small size tube. So um, the article is mentioning ET tubes with two to 2.5 um, millimeter. This I, I presume is it referring to internal diameter, which is what we typically measure them in. And please note, that silicone tubes are preferred because they're they're external. The external diameter of the tube um, does vary depending on the um, the material. So, like those older red rubber style uh, ET tubes are really thick. So, so a two or a two and a half in that style has a larger external diameter compared to the silicone tube. And then in those red rubber tubes, you can actually see the fogging very well. So. Um, so for, you know, like for a, a cat that's four kilos, I'm probably going for like a three and a half, sometimes a four, depending on like the size of the cat. Um, not that I'm doing cats very often <laughs> anymore. Um, but, um, you do need really small tubes and it's just because it, it can be quite traumatic to try to fit a bigger tube in if you're doing the blind technique. So, um, so local anesthetic is applied on the tube or, or, um, the technique that I learned was to insult into the tube and then like do a quick little and that passes into the tube. Technically, that's not very safe because that can, I guess, leave you open to zoonotic disease transmission and neuro open your eyes probably shouldn't because we should all be very careful about that. Um, but realistically, you're not having any direct like mouth to patient contact. So, and um, they don't really cough very like violently like some dogs where you're, you're putting your tube in, you're like, mm, am I in? And the dog like coughs in your face and it's disgusting. Um, cause that happens sometimes with bigger, bigger dogs or like really big goobery cats. I've, I had that happen once. Um, we had to anesthetize like a, a really nastily upper rest cat once. I don't remember why it's a very long time ago this happened, but I remember the cat like in my face when I was intubating and that's just gross. So, um, use breath sounds or watch fogging, gently advance. Um, and then the rabbit typically will have like a slight cough as the tube enters the trachea. Um, and then we're listening for breath sounds. Uh, placing a capnograph, which is necessary for some of the techniques we're going to talk about. Um, and um, of course, like watching to see if your reservoir bag, once your patient's hooked up to the circuit, is moving appropriately. Um, because it is very possible to have these, have, you know, to totally miss your timing and have the animal swallow the tube instead. And then it's in the esophagus and not the trachea. And that's not very helpful. So, um, so she's describing that the pros of blind intubation are, um, or that it is actually easy to perform once you get used to it, especially if you're doing a lot of larger rabbits. Um, it, it's definitely a technique that takes some practice, uh, but it, it is technically kind of difficult. And of course you can truly damage those, the glottis tissues, the glottal tissues. Um, and what tends to happen, I think I segued a little bit there, um, is that if you do have quite a bit of laryngeal edema there um, from traumatizing the, uh, the glottis, and their return cartilages. Um, if you get your tube in, then you've assured that you have a, a, a patent airway. Um, but then once the animal's extubated and you no longer are, are um, kind of maintaining the, the patency of that airway, then um, you can have an animal become uh, hypoxemic because they're not able to breathe properly. They can have shredder, so that upper respiratory wheezing sound, and they can just have a very bad time. And sometimes this is when we lose them in recovery, unfortunately. So that is a, a reason for post anesthetic death in rabbits. So it's something that we have to be really, really firmly aware of when we are using this technique. And if you're not familiar with the technique and you're trying to practice on a patient that's not a cadaver um, or isn't, you know, planned to be euthanized, um, then you know it's, it's it's something we really have to be aware of so um uh, yeah so they're talking a little bit about another risk is that rabbits can have food in the oropharyngeal region so um i find that this tends to be more like a guinea pig thing um where guinea pigs are often smuggling snacks in their cheeks and um and, you know, preoperatively cleaning that out is important. Um, rabbits tend not to have as much 
uh, as much food material in their mouth in my experience, but it is possible. And if you're doing the blind technique and not visualizing the oral cavity with an endoscope or with a, a laryngoscope in a larger rabbit, then you absolutely can, you know, accidentally push food into the trachea or push like purulent material or what, what have you into the trachea. Um, and just, you know, you don't, you just don't see what you're doing because it's a blind technique. So that is a risk, although it's never something I've incurred, I've encountered in practice, thankfully. So, um, endoscopy is very useful, but again, endoscopes are expensive. We don't all have access to that in our practices. I don't have access to that right now. Um, so they do have to be quite sedate, um, rabbits that can still have, um, reactive movements of their jaws that can still masticate or chew we shouldn't be using endoscopes because they can really hurt themselves by chewing on the endoscope and also you will probably piss off a coworker by having a rabbit or a patient damage your endoscope because they are expensive um so these are again they're extended in the the uh, hyperextended um head position um, typically it's safest to place a mouth gag to protect the endoscope so like a plastic gag or whatever kind of gag you have available works great um, and then again she's describing two different techniques here so either visualizing the glottis with the tube being passed in the glottis so this is like the side-by-side -side technique where you see the glottis and then you pass your tube next you know next to your endoscope and pass it into the glottis or pass a stylet, which can sometimes be easier, and then kind of thread your tube over the stylet. Um, and then the other technique, which works better with like a flexible endoscope, is to put the endoscope or put the tube on the end of the endoscope and then insert the tube with the endoscope into the glottis and then you slide your tube in. So, um, and again, you can either spray your local anesthetic directly on the glottis or apply it directly to the tube, whatever works best for you. Um, I find that applying it to the tube, I feel like you need quite a large volume of fluid and I haven't really ever had success with that technique. I'm interested to know like what product they're using as a topical anesthetic here. Um, are they using like a xylocaine jelly? Like is that, I don't know if I would use that. Um, anyway, I'm just, I'm spitballing. I'm not sure what kind of product they're using. If they're like basically just applying like a few drops of lidocaine or spritzing it with the lidocaine spray, I'm not sure. Um, so of course, direct visualization of the glottis is ideal. Like imagine having to like intubate blindly in a cat or a dog. That's not really considered standard of care in those species because we can easily visualize the glottis. And again, if you're used to this technique, it can allow for rapid intubation. Um, you can visualize food left in the pharynx and then remove it um, so that it doesn't pass into the uh, into the glottis, into the trachea. Um, and, and again, like the cons, of course, it's expensive to have an endoscope. We don't all have access to that. Um, you can risk damaging the equipment and really ticking off your coworkers or practice manager because then you have to replace some expensive stuff. Um, the size of the rabbit patient can be limiting, so I wonder if she's referring to like the extremely dwarf rabbits that are like barely a kilogram fully grown um, when we're talking about using the endoscope as, as a stylus. So that's just, those are just some limitations. So endoscopy is great, um, but not always feasible. So using laryngoscope or otoscope, this is a relatively small rabbit, so I'm kind of impressed that they're that they're able to visualize the glottis using this technique. Um, so these these are both using the same principle that you're just trying to make like a path in that narrow, long oral cavity to see what's going on, um, to see and visualize the glottis. And again, this is technically very challenging because of the very long narrow cavity and because the, the cheek tissue is very, um, very uh, prominent and because the torus lingui is very prominent. Um, so yeah, um, I really don't like this technique. Like I've used an otoscope to Hail Mary intubate a guinea pig once during a, a resuscitation and that was more luck than anything. Um, I know it's possible with an endoscope and it's possible like with a lot of practice and an otoscope, but I feel like these techniques, like they're, they're only really feasible in larger rabbits. I don't feel like visualizing in a smaller rabbit is very, is very, uh, technically possible using these techniques, but they are listed here for completion's sake, of course. Um, 
So, of course, it says it's technically easy here, and I don't know about that. <laughs> um, I guess in a really large bunny, I would probably say yes. Um, there's minimal risk of soft tissue damage. I don't know about that. I feel like sometimes, like, if you if you have a hard time aiming, it might still, you might still traumatize. Um, you can probably do your local anesthetic application pretty easily. Um, and of course, you can visualize food in the pharynx. But again, if you're using, like, an otoscope, um, or, you know, if you're using a laryngoscope and you're kind of pushing down the tongue or pushing the cheeks aside, I feel like you can still miss some food in the oropharyngeal space. So I, I don't think it gives you perfect visualization of the oral cavity. Um, and again, you do need a specialized laryngoscope blade. So you do need straight blades and you do need to have small blades because the mouth, the oral cavity is so small. So, um, and of course you can use a stylet to visualize and then, you know, thread your, uh, so place your stylet into the glottis and then thread your ET tube over the stylet. That is a very, very viable technique. Um, so fairly interesting. And then um, the next thing she's talking about here, which is something that's going to come up in a couple of the other papers, is the superglottic airway devices. So they called them SAD, <laughs> which is kind of funny. So this is basically the V-gel by Doxinovant. Um, I think it's patented. I think they hold a patent for it because there aren't any other competitors making it as far as I know. Um, but... Um, they're really interesting and apparently a human anesthesia does use superglottic airway devices which is kind of cool so they basically kind of like fill the oral space and fill or block the esophagus so that the only open pathway is into the airway um so they are designed as a species specific uh i guess device um like you can't just take a rabbit one and use it on a guinea pig because their oral cavities have like a slightly different structure so it wouldn't work um, so kind of interesting, um, a few things that we find are pretty common issues with V-gels or supraglottic airway devices is that, um, you do really need a capnograph to confirm placement. So, um, because the, 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 uh, device itself is like so chunky and so big, um, it's, it is a really hard to confirm and then maintain placement without a capnograph. Um, they are kind of finicky with positioning. Um, in my experience, going like a size down from what the a company recommends works a little bit better. Um, and again, like they're very finicky to kind of keep in place so they can shift really easily and then you suddenly cut off your patient's airway, which is really dangerous. So they do really require capnography so you can keep an eye on on that entitle CO2 and ensure that the animal does have uh, a patent airway the whole time because the ETCO2 is just so, um, it's so real time. Um, so if you suddenly have a, a like no ETCO2, your, your car entitle carbon dioxide is zero, that's a real time response to, oh no, the animal doesn't have a patent airway. Um, Whereas like if you're relying on SpO2, so your, um, your oxygen saturation, there's a lag there. So it's only once the animal has their airway cut off for, I mean, not necessarily that long, but long enough to, nest, to potentially be <clears throat> significant um, that you'll see an SpO2 drop. And then like you're fiddling, like is it, is it because of something else uh, or is it because my V-gel isn't uh, in place? So um, the Docs and Event website has a lot of great videos and other um, resources just discussing how these work and how to use them. Um, and again, I think that they're really useful devices in some situations. Um, they do take up all of the oral cavities. So we can't use them for dentals um, because the doctor is working in the mouth for a dental. Um, so this is, again, very... Um, very well described by the company. They do provide a lot of support. Um, they do note that sometimes you appreciate some cyanosis of the tip of the tongue um, just because of how it's placed. And that worries me a little bit. Like I'd be worried in a very long procedure um, if you could be causing like an ischemic injury to that tissue. We don't want to have like a necrotizing tongue. That would be really scary. I've actually never seen that happen um, in a prolonged period or uh, I've never really used a V-gel for a very long procedure. Um, but yeah, that worries me a little bit if you do have a longer procedure. So it is technically like a pretty easy technique um, and it tends to be very fast. So it's something that we'll look at in the other papers that we're gonna go over tonight. 
Um, and of course, unfortunately, you do need capnography, which I guess isn't unfortunate because capnography is such a useful um, parameter to monitor anesthetic patients with, regardless of what species you're working with. Um, so uh, you do need to capnograph, but like really, we should all have capnographs anyway in a perfect world. Um, and, you know, if you move the patient, you might dislodge it. So you have to be really careful with that. Um, and then positive pressure and uh, ventilation, so PPV, can cause gastric bloat, gastric tympani, um, if the device is dislodged. So something that I've found the V-gel is really useful for is resuscitation. So um, if you have an animal come in who is either uh, apneic or in arrest, um, or an arrest happens in hospital and it's not an anesthetic arrest where you probably also have an, already have an airway, um, because the other techniques, the other techniques that are kind of low tech, um, like the blind intubation, that does require the animal to be breathing and not be apneic or not be arrested. So because you're watching for fogging of the tube or you're listening for, oh, excuse me, uh, you're listening for the sound of uh, breathing. If the animal is in arrest, like you just can't use that technique. Um, you have to either visualize it directly using an endoscope or uh, the other techniques, which again, I don't feel like they work in most patients unless they're really big bunnies. Um, or you can place a V-gel and um, as long as the placement is good, you can definitely start uh, positive pr pressure ventilation to so start respirating the animal. So. Um, I find that they are good to keep on hand for resuscitations. So nasal intubation, oh, sorry guys, uh, nasal intubation um, does kind of, like she says, takes advantage of the fact that they're obligate nasal breathers. So you can have a, you can, again, theoretically pass a, a nasal tube through the nares into uh in basically like over that soft palate because you're skipping the soft palate and into the trachea um but um it, it doesn't always work um it which is hard to explain so the animal does have to be in oh gosh a natural head position so that we do maintain so that we do maintain um, this natural passage of air here so that you're going through the nares. There is like a, a hump here. It's a little sigmoid. And then you're passing, uh, you know, over the tooth roots, which if you have screwy tooth roots, like a retrograde elongation of your tooth roots, this technique probably doesn't work because unfortunately this passage is then um, partially occluded by the abnormal tooth roots. And then it technically would pass like oh, over the soft palate into the trachea. Um, but it's unfortunately not always that reliable. So, um, so basically, uh, sorry, the technique is technically not that challenging, um, but you can definitely accidentally intubate the esophagus as well. So capnograph is really useful. Um, so you can use very small nasogastric tubes, so red rubber catheters can technically be used for this. Um, if there's a reason not to do an oro, like an orotracheal intubation, like if you have a rabbit for a dentistry, this could be an option. Um, but again, like if you have incisor tooth roots or again, like retrograde elongation of the cheek tooth roots or jugal teeth roots, then that can be really terrible. Um, like it's just traumatic and it, it, you know, you can't necessarily pass the tube. And then there is a concern that you can um, transmit or carry Oh geez, sorry guys, I'm hitting a wall. Um, you can carry pasturella from the nasal cavity into the um, trachea and then cause pneumonia. Um, I don't know if this is supported in other literature um, by case studies or um, other experimental studies, as nothing is referenced here, but this is a theoretical risk. So it's something to consider because um, pasturella is part of the natural flora in many rabbits, but it can become an opportunistic pathogen. So tracheostomies are an emergency technique. I'm going to skip over this because this isn't like a typical, it's not a typical um, intubation technique and it's an advanced technique. Um, so that is a great review. Um, and again, I highly recommend looking up this paper because it is free online on Doc Sinovan's website. Um, and it goes over intubation techniques like in great detail like we just saw. So those are basically what we're working with. So um, this is a paper sent to me by a friend. Um, so let me just zoom in here. So this is from Veterinary Evidence. Um, and this is a, um, I guess this person is a, a bachelor's in biology, probably somebody who's in like pre-vet 
um, Bachelor's of Veterinary Biology, I think this is. So um, from the Sydney School of Veterinary Science in Australia. This was published last year in July, so last summer. Um, so it's looking at, basically looking at a few different controlled studies or so uh, randomized controlled trials and one was a randomized crossover trial um, and then another peer-reviewed conference proceeding that's reviewing different modes of airway access in rabbits. So particularly, oh, I can't stop yawning, I'm sorry guys. Um, I gotta do these streams way earlier, I think. So particularly looking at um, the V-gel or superglottic airway device, which they're calling, uh, hang on, what are they calling it here? There's a... There, it's SGAD, so superglottic airway device instead of just SAD. <laughs> um, so they're looking at superglottic airway devices versus um, endotracheal tube intubation. Um, so she's looking at a few different studies and just kind of comparing the evidence. So the first one is Ingbers and Associates from 2017. Um, they used New Zealand white lab rabbits, which are a large rabbit breed. So they're great for experimental models, but not always representative of what we see in practice, especially if you're like where I am and everybody has these like little dwarf rabbits and dwarf rabbit mixes because they're so cute, but they're disasters for health and like the worst to intubate because they're so small. Um, so they started with 15 rabbits and they ended up only using a final sample size of 13 rabbits and they go over that. Um... They randomized which group they went to uh, fast for two hours prior to, uh, prior to the experiment, which I don't know how I feel about that. I don't think that's necessary for rabbits. Um, we generally will just take food away about a half hour before. And again, we rarely see, um, we rarely see like a food debris, ingested debris in the mouth um, at the time of intubation. But again, I guess we're not using endoscopes currently in my practice. So there could be something we're missing, I guess. Um, and they're using midazolam, dexmedetomidine with alfaxalone, which uh, for induction, which I assume would be IV um, or a heavy dose IM tentatively. So like a pretty um, pretty basic protocol. There's just nothing here for pain uh, pain management, and that that kind of makes sense because this isn't a painful procedure, so they're not adding an opioid. Um, and then they looked at CT scans, which is great, just to um, just to kind of assess like what's happening with those devices. Um, they selected the superglottic airway devices so the V gels based on subject mass, so the patient body weight, and then they lubricated, positioned it as per manufacturer directions. Um, they used blind technique for endotracheal tube. Uh, size is being selected based on the experience of the operator. So that's just like, I guess, like the personal experience of the operator. So it wasn't like just a, the two kilogram rabbit gets blah. And then the three kilogram rabbit gets blah. These are New Zealand whites. So they're all like probably more than that. They're probably closer to like four kilograms. Hang on. What's the, I should know this, but we actually don't really see a lot of New Zealand white rabbit average weight. Um, I used to work with New Zealand whites like in lab animal science a uh, four and a half to five point four. Okay. I wasn't totally off base. I was thinking like four to five kilos. Um, so we don't really see these a lot as pets where I am. Um, but I have worked with a lot of New Zealand whites in the past. So, um, so I, it, it, they didn't like predetermine what size ET tubes to use. It was up to the operator or the person doing the intubation up to their experience. Um, and then they did like the typical technique, confirmed placement with positive capnography. Um, they secured both behind the ears with a bandage tie, and then they did some vitals, looking at uh, isoflurane concentration, uh, five centimeters away from the mouth. So tested by closing the airway valve. I'm not sure what they mean by this. Like, so is this, did they like remove the circuit and then tested like isoflurane that's breathed out i wonder it's not super clear based on this like summary i'd have to look up the original paper so that's a good question i missed it on my first pass through this paper um so then they looked at arterial blood gas samples which arterial blood blood is pretty easy to obtain in rabbits especially new zealand whites that have really nice long ears um because you're just using the central auricular artery i would assume because that's really easy to access and then um, they were maintained under anesthesia for an hour. And then they euthanized them at the end. And um, 
they did exclude a couple of rabbits from the uh, from the group just because one was unable to be intubated and it doesn't really explain why here. And one had fecal matter in the oropharynx, which is probably a cecotroph because um, they're not technically corprophagic, they're cecotrophic. So um, it was probably a cecotroph in the oropharynx. So that's, that's not uncommon. Um, they took away the food, but the rabbit makes its own food, right, to an extent. So... Um, so the outcomes that they looked at are like time to successful device insertion, uh, how many attempts that the, that the operator took to um, place the device successfully. The narrowest region of the upper airway was measured using CT. Um, and then the airway ceiling pressure. So they basically did a low pressure leak test once the uh, unit was, or the circuit was hooked up to the patient. And then they looked at uh, histological score of tracheal tissue. So just to make sure that there isn't any to look at like trauma or focal erosion um, or ulceration of um, of that tissue from the devices they were using. And then arterial blood gas to make sure that everything in their metabolism is like peachy keen, right? So, um, so apparently the device insertion time is significantly shorter and more consistent in the superglottic airway device group compared to ETT group, which is, that's not surprising because again, the, uh, the uh, V-gel is technically quite easy to place. Um, there's no significant difference between uh, device placements, probably because they had pretty experienced operators doing the blind technique. Um, no significant difference between the narrowest region of upper airway. Uh, median airway seal was higher in the ETT tube groups, the tracheal tube group, which is not a, not surprising because you're actually in the trachea and not just like over it, where if you're putting quite a bit of air pressure, like maybe there's a bit of air leakage. Um, oh, interesting. So there was a significantly mean, a higher mean histological score for the ETT group, a 3.3. So I guess that makes sense because they were looking at, ah, interesting. Huh. So they did definitely have more trauma to the airway from, e uh, from placing the endotracheal tubes with the blind technique, um, which is interesting because presumably these are pretty experienced operators doing this, especially if they're, you know, um, if they didn't have a massive difference between uh, placement techniques. That's really interesting. Hmm. Um, and then a diff significant difference between arterial blood gases and electrolytes and all that. So, um, so of course, yeah, they're discussing how other methods may result in reduced tracheal injury because you can actually visualize it. Um, low ASA status and of course same breed so like this might be this might be a very different outcome if we tried it in uh, like a dwarf rabbit breed um, mm -hmm. this is important too because these patients were euthanized immediately after the study um, it doesn't necessarily mean that that trauma is clinically significant. So histologically, it does sound really scary that there was quite, you know, extensive ulceration and focal, uh, focal hemorrhage or erythema. Um, but, um, you know, are these animals actually going to be impacted by that longer term? It's hard to say. You can't, you can't necessarily draw that conclusion from the study because they didn't look at how these animals did longer term post-op. But it is still important to consider. Um, okay, yeah, they didn't use IPPV. And they were trained to use the V-Gel on an online training course, so probably the Doxinibin course. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. If they had more training, then, you know, maybe it would be faster, which is true for anything. And then no significant statistical difference, maybe due to small sample size. Yeah, because there were only 13 animals used again. So if you repeated the study, you know, would you have the same thing um, with different operators or... Um, yeah, it's interesting. And then, um, so the next study they're reviewing here is Kamoli and Associates from 2020. So again, New Zealand whites, because they're the lab rabbit. So again, not necessarily um, representative of the rabbit population that we see in practice. Um, ASA status uh, less than one, um, which I thought, I thought one was the lowest. Hang on, ASA score, score anesthesia. I thought it was one to four and one is lowest risk. Because we use a one to four chart for us. Hang on. 
Yeah, so less than one, how do you have a score of less than one? Like, do you classify them as zero? They might be using a different scoring chart. I would, I think that that's what's happening here because um, like we tend to use a one to four and then five is like, eesh, yeah, that's terrible. And we don't really use six um, because we unfortunately don't really deal with brain dead patients in an extensive capacity like you would in human medicine where people might be, you know, they might have brain damage or might be in a coma. Um, so then they might be, like an ASA six if there there's organ don organ donation happening there, um, but yeah we use a one to four and then like five is terrible um, in practice. So I wonder if they're just using a slightly different yeah because then it doesn't make sense because if it starts at one you can't have a score less than one. So they must be using a different charting where like zero is probably your lowest risk patient. So interesting. Um, Again, like this is just reviewing these studies. This isn't actually like the verbatim copying of these studies. So randomized uh, two groups, intracranial intubation, and then a superglottic device. They used ketamine, meloxicam, and xylazine induced with meloxicam. I feel like that's just like an oversight in this. You don't induce with meloxicam. Meloxicam doesn't have any sedative or analgesic, or sorry, it's analgesic, but doesn't have any sedative properties um, or like muscle relaxant properties. So I think that's just like, a transcription error. Um, so induced with ketamine xylazine. Ket ketamine xylazine is kind of common in some places, like especially for wildlife or lab animal. Um, they use the laryngoscope because, oh sorry, they use an endoscope because they're fancy. They have endoscopy, which I wish we all had. Um, ET tubes lubricated, connected to capnograph. B-gel introduced with capnograph. And they, they did the spay. And they use an endoscope to again assess the appearance of larynx and glottis. And then four days postmortem, they look uh, four days following the study. Sorry, they euthanized and did postmortem samples. Uh, they did pretty standard um, anesthetic monitoring here with all these parameters. And they use modified Jackson Reese non thing circuit, so kind of like a pediatric circuit. So. Do, 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 do. So this is what they looked at. They looked at placement times, um, number of attempts, so similar to the first study. Um, required level of ISO concentration, that's interesting. Arterial blood gas values again, and then gross laryngeal and laryngotracheal histopathology. So looking at inflammation um, and whether it was focal, or multifocal, or diffuse. So significantly longer to endoscopically intubate rabbits, which, um, which again, that might be like an operator issue because everybody who uses endoscopes and talks about them in lectures is like, it's so fast once, you know, you get used to it. So this may have been like an operator issue, um, or, you know, it's hard to say because I still think that if you're really good with an endoscope, it still takes you longer to use the endoscope to directly visualize everything and then get your tube in compared to placing a V-gel because the V-gel is so quick. So median placement time, 48 seconds versus V-gel medium placement time, six seconds. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense in my head. Um, number of attempt, all V-gel only required one attempt because it's super easy. Um, two and tracheal tube intubations required three attempts. Yikes, so I wonder what happened there. And then no statistical difference between ISO concentrations used to maintain, that's not surprising. Oh, interesting. VGEL has statistically significant increased levels of PCO2. Ooh. So then are these animals actually ventilating properly? Hmm. So is that like a VGEL sizing issue then? Because maybe you're, maybe you're like kind of occluding part of the glottis. So you're not allowing the animal to ventilate very well. Interesting. And then everything else was not statistically significant and trauma present in both groups, but no statistically different uh, significance between groups. Interesting. Yeah, and of course the V-gel was more easily displaced when changing patient, patient position. So like moving from prop to OR or, you know, just adjusting patient position. So all performed by the same experienced anesthetist. Of course, yeah, we can't necessarily extrapolate to people who are not as experienced. So that's interesting. Um, and of course, anesthetist wasn't blinded, may have improved with skills over time with repeated procedures. And that's really true. Like if you're just using one operator, like it's... It's just human nature. We get better at things once we practice in theory. Um, and of course, same breed and procedure may impact application general rabbit population. Of course, we have all these dumb dwarf rabbits that we treat that are so frustrating because they're so tiny and everything is hard on them. 
Um, IPPD not used, so they didn't check airway ceiling pressures. Um, and then again, it's another small sample size, so let's just do it on a hundred rabbits and see. <laughs> um, fortunately, that's not always feasible, like with just money. Money it takes money to do studies. So um, Toman and Associates in 2015, more New Zealand whites, 24 rabbits, so like almost double the, the sample size, and they were looking at e uh, tracheal intubation. Laryngeal mask airway, perilaryngeal airway. What is all of this? I didn't flip this far before. I thought that it, I didn't, I wasn't expecting this. Um, and then the V gel. So, uh, xylazine ketamine, rocuronium bromide. Oh, that's a weird experimental thing, I think. Hang on. That's weird experimental stuff. Aminosteroid non depolarizing neuromuscular blocker or modern rela muscle relaxant. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's used for mechanical ventilation so that, you know, you don't like have a patient, human or otherwise, like buck the ventilator if you need them on a ventilator. Interesting. Okay, yeah, that's sorry, a segue. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't read that far. I, I kind of wasn't expecting that uh, uh, this, uh, I guess, curveball with all these different techniques here. Um, animals ventilated, they did regular monitoring, blood pressure, heart rate, E, K, G, measured, no pulse ox, no end tidal CO2. Okay, manually ventilated, 1.15% isoflurane. What kind of um, vaporizer is that? I want to see that vaporizer. My vaporizer is not that precise. I don't think I've ever seen a vaporizer that precise and I used to work in research. Uh, okay, so looking at QT infos correct for heart rate, so mean arterial pressure, blood gas values, heart rate. Okay, no statistically significant difference between groups for baseline intervals on the EKGs. So we technically had like more of a bradycardia in the endotracheal tube group. And then the other laryngeal devices. Huh. Interesting. This is a weird study. I, I kind of want to look up the study after to see, like, I just want to see a description of, oops, I scrolled too far, hang on, of the laryngeal mask airway. So is this a different, this is probably sort of a different type of superglottic device. And the peri, perilaryngeal airway, so they're probably just like different styles of super loud devices. Maybe they're just like super experimental. <laughs> or Dachshund event like sued because they have the patent. <laughs> um, okay. So same anesthetist, different operator, sample size, limit power results, of course, because yeah, it's bigger than the other studies, but still not a big study. Okay. Graphs and no numerical data, standard deviations, so it's difficult to extrapolate. Yeah, this is just like kind of a weird study. I don't know. I'm kind of gonna look it up later just to be like, what's the point of this? All right. Um. So then, Winger and Associates, 2017. Again, New Zealand whites. <sighs> Do this in dwarf rabbits, please. Just kidding. That would make their life hellish for the study. Um. It's only ten rabbits. Actually, nine rabbits. Um, so acclimated them to the environment, didn't fast them, which is typically what we do. Again, we do an extremely short fast of just like 30 minutes ish. Um, oh, they were each anesthetized four times for each of these different types of airway devices. So on um, tracheal tubes, laryngeal mask, V gel, and then face masks. And then they used, um, this is Hypnorm. I used to use Hypnorm in lab with, uh, with rabbits. So fentanyl and fluanosome. Um, Hypnorin's hard to get in Canada. We only got it because it was McGill University because um, we were we were big time. Um, so induce the propofol, jaw tone, palpebral reflex, reaction to lidocaine, protraction of tongue. So all the things that we would do, we look at for um, for patient intubation. So just to check our, our status, our, uh, sorry, our anesthetic plane to see if we are deep enough or sedated enough to place an airway device. Devices placed blindly, no endoscopes, checked leakage, did CTs, 
okay, yeah. So then they started, um, they started a ventilator after using rocuronium bromide. So the same drug that, uh, respiratory suppressant basically, or muscle relaxant. Ooh, signs of upper airway obstruction. That's terrible. So, um, they looked at how much propofol they needed, how long it took to put the airway device, how many times it took or how many attempts it took, what kind of airway leakage we saw at inspired peak inspiratory pressure. And then they CT to see how the, uh, device, um, device positioning went. So, um, of course, less purple fall needed for a face mask because you're not actually securing the airway with a face mask. It's just going over the face. That makes perfect sense. Um, no significant difference between the other two, other, other groups. So that makes sense. Of course, less time face mask group. What do you mean? 82 seconds plus or minus 34 seconds. How long does it take to place a face mask? I want to, I want to read the study now. Um, no significant difference between other groups, blah, blah, blah. Uh, less attempts needed in the face mask group. Yeah, because <laughs> it's a face mask. Um, no significant difference between the other groups. Airway leakage at peak inspiratory pressure. Um, more leakage in face mask group, of course, because face masks are not perfect compared with the other groups. Okay, interesting. And then the V-gel showed a leak at other pressures compared to the, uh, compared to ETT. Okay, CT. Laryngeal compression seen in one VGL subject. Interesting. So moderate laryngeal compression being seen in two subjects without significant differences. Okay. Of course, gas in stomach and face mask because it's not a and laryngeal mask because those are not um, direct or sorry, at least the face mask was not like directly uh, controlling that airway. Okay. Oh, everything placed by board certified anesthetists. So why did it take them so long to place a face mask? <laughs> I have to look at the study to see. That's really interesting. Small sample size, same braid weight, blah, blah, blah. Four treatments apply to the same animal. So of course we can see laryngeal trauma. Um, degree of tympanism could have been more profound. Gas was not assessed for the ingesta of the stomach, only dorsal gaseous phase. Interesting. Okay. Huh. Okay. Oh, wow. Norfolk rabbits, not New Zealand whites. So this is also a pretty big rabbit breed, not as big as New Zealand whites. And, and, and they're not dwarves. And they only use eight of them. So um, Cruz and Associates from 2000. Um, subjects anesthetized twice one week apart. ETT versus laryngeal mask. Premedicated methotrimeprazine and thiopentone. Ooh, I don't like those drugs. Um, this is a barbiturate, so that's like hardcore old stuff or lab animal stuff. Oh, okay, and then they used a contrast medium looking at the stomach, so maybe to, to assess like gastric tympani. Um, and then intubation, the same inexperienced operator for two attempts, and then an experienced operator uh, performed intubation. So once they failed twice, they're like, bring in the person who like can do the technique. Okay. Immediately after removal of the ETT, and they took x-rays to look for regurgitation and aspiration of the contrast medium. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, so they looked at the dose of thiopentone, once again, barbiturate, yikes, um, a regurgitation of stomach contents following anesthesia, and then difference between anesthetic parameters and the number of attempts to take, uh, taken to place the airway device. So um, no regurgitation, which is not surprising because rabbits have an extremely tight uh, cardiac or, or uh, gastroesophageal sphincter. So that's not surprising there wasn't any regurgitation. Um, Dose of thiopentone required higher dose for intracheal intubation, which makes sense because, again, like if you're intubating the trachea, you need a higher dose of induction agent, regardless of what that agent is, whether it's propofol or effexolone or a barbiturate like thiopentone. Um, no difference between aesthetic parameters. And then, yeah, ETT intubation or ETT. Yeah, ETT intubation is successful in three out of eight animals at the first attempt. So again, because these are pretty big rabbits. So if you have an inexperienced person, you have somebody who knows what they're doing directing you, it's not surprising that they did get some attempts on the first try. 
So small sample size, only eight rabbits. Um, and they didn't actually do surgery, so that's also kind of a limitation. Um, larger breeds, of course, smaller dwarf breeds. Yeah, we see tons of those. And no details on exclusion. And Norfolk is not really a recognized rabbit breed, so that's interesting. Hang on. Norfolk rabbit. I feel like I've seen Norfolk rabbit listed as a breed in some places, but I am not sure. Hang on. We're just going to go. Where's my home button? Is Norfolk rabbit a breed? Shh, don't tell anyone I'm Googling this. <laughs> Okay, so nothing here is helpful. I feel like I've, I see Norfolk rabbits like described frequently, so maybe it's just not a recognized breed, um, but I definitely have seen them described like in literature and um, same inexperienced practitioner. So yeah, of course, this is very true. So yeah, we know that face masks are not great for airway maintenance because we can't make a great seal. So for short procedures, yeah, but always make sure you have your intubation stuff ready. Um, ETTs, successfully used in small animal practice. And of course, if you can visualize the trachea, it works really well. Blind technique, again, you know, like what they're trying to evaluate or some of these studies were looking at evaluating, like even if the blind technique seemed to be successful, you know, is there trauma histologically? And unfortunately, none of them really looked at long-term um, morbidity from that. They just looked at like very short-term histological evidence and not like how do these animals do longer term and how long did that take to heal or what have you, which would be challenging. It would be hard because it's not like you can just go do a tracheal biopsy willy-nilly and um, see how it looks at like the day post-op and then a week post-op and then two weeks post-op. That's not necessarily feasible. Um, so many superglottic devices. Yeah, ASA scores and only um, one study assessed the use of both devices those subjects were undergoing a procedure. Yeah, there's only one study there where they actually spayed the rabbits. Um, yeah, and of course the V-gel is really easy to use, very fast, more consistent. So if you are in a location where you do have to do with the occasional rabbit anesthesia, maybe you're not, um, you don't have access to like an endoscope or you just don't have a way to practice that, um, or, you know, you just don't have a way to practice, um, oh gosh, practice a uh, blind technique very well, then superglottic airway devices are a great kind of compromise. Um, so yeah, it just kind of goes over some things that are kind of obvious. Use successful, resulting in gastric tympanism. So this is probably, again, um, just like a misseated or a mis missized device, or the device became misseated. So watching your capnograph is really important. Yeah, so strong cardiac, so they're talking about the strong cardiac sphincter preventing backflow of gastric contents, which we know. Okay, I'm just going to keep scrolling here. More research is warranted. That's always the case. <laughs> Both devices can be used to effectively maintain anesthesia in rabbit patients. So, yeah, that's that's pretty fair. Um, yeah, so they just kind of review that stuff. These are the references. So that's really cool. So then um, this is another study, which we're going to go over really quickly because we're almost out of time here because... Once again, I'm clearly really tired. So this is uh, from Frontiers in Veterinary Science from August 2021, looking at B-gel guided tracheal intubation in rabbits. So this is really cool. So basically, this study is looking at placing a V-gel to kind of block off everything but the airway and then intubating through the V-gel, which is really neat. So um, they're basically looking at outcomes and clues, similar to the other, uh, other studies that were looked at in that previous paper. So number of intubation attempts, time for achievement of intracheal intubation, endoscopic findings, and then uh, arterial blood glass analysis. So um, basically, I'm just going to go down to look at these pictures. This is great. Yeah, this is super cool. Hang on, I want to zoom in on this. I go 300%. It's a little blurry. Yeah, so um, they use the V-gel 
to basically block off everything except the glottis and then I place the stylet and then remove the V-gel over the stylet and then place the ET tube back over the stylet <laughs> intubated. So it's really cool. This is really innovative. It's really neat. So, um, yeah, pretty cool. So hang on, let's just skip down here to the results. So um, the person who performed the intubations was pretty consistent. Uh, investor couldn't be blinded. So again, like they may have just gotten better at the technique as time went by. Um, they uneventfully recovered from each anesthetic event, no complications, full data set uh, coverage. So they, um, they used propofol to induce these animals. 0 0.5 to 1 mg per kg boluses, which is probably IV. That kind of makes sense. And a single IV bolus of glycopyrrole was administered to eight animals to treat bradycardia with hypotension. Yikes. Okay, and then, whoops. So number of attempts for each intubation method. So blind uncuffed and blind cuffed were much higher compared to the V-gel with stylet and V-gel plus an uncuffed too, because there was a technique here too, where instead of the stylet, they just used like a very small uncuffed um, Murphy in a tracheal tube here. And then these are endoscopic images, which is great. Um, so, so yeah, basically I'm um, using the V-gel to like guide your endotracheal tube placement, whether you use a stylet or not, was much, much, um, I, not, I wouldn't want to say easier, but it required less attempts, which is great, um, to secure that airway. So this is a really cool technique. So this is something that I would definitely consider. Um, I don't have V-gels where I'm at now, but I think that, they, again, they are really useful for resuscitation. So I would consider achieving, um, you know, endotracheal intubation in a patient arrest, like this non anesthetic, using these techniques. So have your V-gel, use your V-gel to like place your ET tube and then ventilate your patient in an emergency. I think that that's a really, really cool thing to do. That would be a really interesting application of this. And they used um, air endoscopic images to assess uh, macroscopically the larynx and glottis. Um, hyperemia, most common finding before and after intubation, and then edema and hemorrhage, also not surprising, especially during the blind techniques. Like, that's just something that can happen. Um, trace blood steering, uh, straining on the exterior of the endotracheal tube was noted for one rabbit. Um, significantly lower... Okay, yeah, that's kind of, that kind of just makes sense. Just saying that, like... Oxygen saturation was a bit lower in some groups. Yeah, so effective and technically easy alternative to a traditionally used blind and tracheal intubation te technique, which is super cool. Again, a really cool study. I, I think that this is a really interesting technique and it could have a lot of applications um, both for people who are not comfortable with the blind technique or people who do the blind technique and they're just like, ah, I really worry about um, about traumatizing because of you know X, Y, Z. I don't do it often or I have tiny rabbit patients. Um, so super cool. And the last thing, I don't actually have access to this paper, um, but this was just another paper from uh, Vet Records, so from the British Veterinary Association, uh, published in July 2020 with Kamoli and, um, you know what, is this actually, is this one referred to in this other paper? Yeah, Kamoli. Yeah, actually, that is definitely this paper. Okay, so we're not gonna we're not gonna look at that. I didn't realize that before, but that's the, that's that paper. So a bunch of like very smart people here. Uh, but yeah, V-gel practical alternative to endotracheal intubation. We knew that. So that's really great. So um, anyway, I hope that you found this to be like a pretty interesting review of some of the literature that we um, have currently on airway access in rabbits. Because again, rabbits can be challenging patients to obtain airway access. Um, if you enjoy this, please like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll be back later in the week with another stream. Thank you.